everybody. Welcome to this um, Humboldt Day event from the IBS Education Committee. I'm Karen Fowler from the International Biogeography Society. Um, and in a few minutes, uh, we're just going to give everybody a few minutes to, to connect. And in the meantime, I'm going to go over some upcoming events um, and also what this session will look like. So uh, International Humboldt Day uh, is a, a week of events, really, that's happening all this week. And I, I encourage you to check out the other events, some of which have already happened, and we'll have videos for them up online, uh, hopefully by next week. And then some are still coming up. So take advantage and participate when you can. And then the International Biogeography Society also has some upcoming conferences. One is the Early Career Biogeographers Conference that is happening virtually online in October. And the other is the 10th Biennial Conference, which it will be a hybrid conference in Vancouver, which I'm, I know I'm super excited about attending theoretically in person. So, and that um, this education committee and Mark Lamolino will be presenting a workshop, um, a longer half day workshop at that conference um, on biogeography education and teaching. And so I encourage you to check it out, um, check out the meeting, check out Vancouver, come and join us. It's, it's really a stunningly beautiful place and I am very excited about that. That is happening in January 8th, 12th of 2022. Thanks, thanks Karen. And uh, I'd love to say that uh, this particular webinar was long in planning. Actually, Karen was able to throw it together for us in I think just about two days. But uh, what we'd like to do is actually summarize uh, the work of the committee. I think there's eight of us now on, on this uh, committee uh, that was established, I think in January of this year, uh, that have been working actually for, I believe, over a year on this, this important initiative. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, this initiative on teaching uh, that grand subject. And I, I could start off with uh, an uh, embarrassing admission that uh, I, actually I've been teaching, this is not the embarrassing part, I've been teaching this subject uh, biogeography or the geography of life for just over 30 years. Um, but I'm one of the uh, people of my generation, all too many of us never took a course in biogeography. Now, the reason for that is, or one well, main reason in my case was, I was at a number of really good colleges and universities, but the course biogeography was never offered at those places. So that's obviously something that we wanted to address. Uh, as a committee, but obviously also as the society uh, to promote the understanding for the geography of life. And this uh, quote or part of the title, um, teaching the grand subject is actually taken from uh, a letter of no less than Charles Darwin. And he was writing to uh, one of his, essentially his protege, one of his protégés, uh, Sir Joseph Dalton Hooker. And Hooker just had, uh, an offer for an appointment at, to teach at a, a university. And uh, Darwin said, I am much obliged for your very agreeable letter. Sorry, I've got no British accent. Um, and he went on, I am astonished at your news and I must condole with you in your present view of professorship. Interpreting, he's saying, he's saying congratulations, but be careful um, a teaching position and, and what it can mean for you and for your career. He went on to say, Darwin went on to say in this letter, if I thought your professorship would stop your work, I should wish it all and all the good of the worldly consequences to essentially go to the devil. Um, Darwin never taught, never had a position like that. Uh, I know I shall live to see you the first authority in Europe on that grand subject that almost keystone the laws of creation, geographical distribution. So many of us actually have heard the last part of it. Actually, he was warning of what teaching at a college university can do in terms of uh, research. And I really did stop Hooker and many of us found that uh, the two go hand in hand. We're better researchers because we're teachers. And I really believe that I didn't know uh, the subjects as nearly uh, well as I should until I had to sit down and actually try and teach them. And we have a society that was created, established in uh, 2001, I believe. Uh, and its mission was really three parts, fostering communication, 
and collaboration between biogeographers, increasing both the awareness and interests of scientific community and the lay public in the contributions of biogeographers and promoting the training and the education of biogeographers. Okay, this is what we established early on uh, when we founded the society. And so obviously it's important to address that third goal. Yeah. This is our initiative on teaching. And what we wanted to do is develop really an integrative strategy for First of all, expanding and enhancing the teaching of biogeography. We know it's actually taught in many places across the globe, but each of us can benefit from conferring with others, seeing what resources they use, what other resources should be developed. The ultimate goal of this training and this particular initiative is the training uh, that this training will become an integral component of undergraduate programs for students interested in the natural world, but also expanded to other levels, including K through 12, right up to postdoctoral training. Now, what's the values of this? So we're, perhaps that expression we're teaching to the choir uh, is appropriate here, but actually there's some real reasons. And when you pro propose to teach a course in any college or university, you've got to explain why, not just to the student body, but especially to the administration. And, I believe this uh, deeply as I could, that there's no other set of subjects, no other discipline, no other course that allows us to teach what we can teach in biogeography. Uh, many of the most compelling, insightful patterns, when we talk about biodiversity, conservation, endangerment, etc., they make these patterns make little sense unless placed in an explicit geographic context. Where is diversity highest? So you, uh, uh, Johann Reinhold Foster was the first to tell us that different places across the globe are really distinct evolutionary arenas. That's what Buffon told us and what we've been trying to explain with evolution and other processes all along. Uh, we dedicate these days to uh, Alexander von Humboldt and certainly he characterized the distinctness of place and used the distinctness of place either along the slopes of a mountain or across the globe to explain how and why nature varies from place to place. And you see these other distinguished people also utilize that for their major revolutions and their epiphanies in how the world is designed and how nature actually has a hand in describing, structuring this thing we call biological diversity. And a course in biogeography I've found over the years is one of the best places to teach what I think are the great stories of how nature works on a grand scale. These are compelling stories. And these are also uh, stories that most learned people should understand and be able to pass on to others. Uh, we talk about science, being scientists, and one of the great lessons uh, I teach early on in the course is the history of science. And that really is the history of scientists and their ideas and how their ideas were shaped by their experiences and how particular strategies work best at identifying, discovering and describing patterns in nature. Uh, another set of compelling stories is the geographic template, how the environment varies in a very non-random structured way from place to place across elevation, latitude, isolation, area, et cetera. That forms the foundation for all of the biodiversity patterns that we might want to describe. And they are all obviously influenced by, and we have to have an understanding of the history, in this case, the history of the planet itself, that the earth is a dynamic planet. Plate tectonics has shaped just about all the pattern, patterns we can look at as ecologists and evolutionary biologists and biogeographers. And one important lesson is when we talk about evolution, it was one of the earliest lessons that goes back to Buffon and Humboldt and others, is that this thing we call evolution occurs not just over time, but across space as well that different places are distinctive and they're distinctive for a combination of reasons. That diversity varies and life forms vary. The, the size and structure and characteristics of the fruit, seeds, et cetera, vary from place to place. 
as, as well as diversity. And those patterns in diversity up a mountain slope, down in depth, from the equator to the poles, these are some of the key patterns that most of the lay public, as well as scientists, want to want to understand and also explain. And related to that, then, there are hot spots of evolution, but just as there are, and we've now been able to identify that, we should also be able to understand and locate and then address uh, our conservation strategies in those hot spots of endangerment. In all this, we've got the principal processes of immigration and evolution and extinction, but we are studying some of the most complex integrative systems uh, anyone could ever con conceive, and those are the life systems across the globe. And one important feature of most systems are feedback effects. In ecological feedback, the things we're studying, the species are actually influencing the abilities of other species too immigrate, to survive, and to evolve. So these are what we talk about, red queens, and the influence of ecology on evolution, and the converse as well. These are two totally integrated and inseparable processes. In all this, especially during the last two million years, and more so more recently, uh, all this is influenced by or has been influenced by us. We are both the modifiers of the environment and also products of nature. And that may be a humbling experience, a uh, humbling lesson really for most students that we show some of the same patterns that others do in terms of how we can move across, how our initial population moves across the globe and then in different places across the globe, how our morphologies, physiologies, cultures, et cetera, were shaped by some of the same selective forces that influence other animals as they move uh, from their sites of origins to other places across the globe. So there are some major lessons, compelling lessons uh, that can be taught when we teach the subject, the geography of life. And so um, the, the committee, actually it should be 2021, the, uh, the committee was established in, uh, I think January of this year um, to address the need to enhance the teaching of biogeography. And, and one of my favorite quotes now comes from this wonderful book, Here Be Dragons uh, by Dennis McCarthy. And uh, in, I believe, one of the first chapters, he says this, biogeography, once a secret delicacy enjoyed only by geniuses, must now be elevated from, from its current obscurity and placed alongside literature and history as indispensable, an indispensable component of a truly enlightened education. I certainly believe that. I couldn't say it as clearly, as persuasively as Dennis McCarthy did. But this is one of our starting points, our motivation for uh, the work we're doing on this committee. And so we've tried to develop, and that really is you know, my goal, uh, as the, the chair, initial chair of the committee, is to help develop a structure, a uh, set of plans for the committee, which we outline in, first of all, our mission statement to address the, that third goal that we establish as founding members of the society, to promote the training and the education of biogeographers, so that we may develop sound strategies for studying and conserving the world's biota. Our central goal then is to enlist the uh, assistance and visions of our colleagues. And that's why we're holding this webinar. That's, that's why we're holding a, a workshop uh, during the meetings in Vancouver uh, next January to enlist your insights, ideas, and your you know, blood, sweat, and tears to, to contribute to what I think is one of the most important things we can do as biogeographers. To get this message out to universities, colleges, secondary schools, and also NGOs and others. The ultimate goal then is that the geography of life will become an integral component of education and outreach to the lay public and all those interested in the natural world. We've developed a strategic plan. We can go over these in details, but it's a three-pronged plan. The first is to gather information. There's a tremendous amount of information available and science has been around of the biogeography for a couple hundred years. People have been teaching it actively 
for decades, especially since uh, Brown and Gibson published their book in 1983, I believe. Uh, so that's one of the things we, we have started and we're continuing to do. And I'll show you some of the results of us gathering information, but we also have to help develop integrative resources for disseminating that information. How do we get it out? How do we package it best? And how do we address the needs of different, quote, consumers? K through 12 versus undergraduate versus graduate versus uh, colleagues, postdocs, et cetera. And how do we uh, engage our colleagues, students, and the lay public? And there are a number of ways to do this. So here we have a, a webinar or a workshop. We've got many other ideas and things that are in the works or at least planning a distinguished le lecture series. We have some of those for other reasons, but uh, we're believe, we believe that we can develop a lecture series tailored to what people would need and actually might be able to use in a particular course. Uh, online exchange uh, fora, we actually uh, want to develop this and pretty soon hopefully we'll launch our website and one of the key features of the website will be a form for exchange of ideas, questions and answers, etc. And there we've got like, obviously many other uh, ideas on how to develop these resources. Um, the membership includes myself and Carl and David and Michael and Mario, uh, Leticia and George and Catherine. Um, and I should dot, dot, dot say, there are many others that we'd like to include. And as we develop both the structure and begin to flesh out the structure, we'll, we will again uh, recruit as many people for different subcommittees to, to assist us and again, what I think is one of the most important initiatives we, we can take on for our society. So we have, again, trying to develop this initial structure, we've developed a basic template of where those educational resources, where that information might fit, and then how we can use this to spread the word out to assist the teaching of this subject across those levels. And so at a number of different levels, we're looking at undergraduate, graduate students and beyond, we've compiled lists and descriptions and links to books, to texts and other expanded works. We will hope to start it to uh, compile a list and links and descriptions of videos on the geography of life and also compile the same for uh, sets of tools that people have used in different parts of the, the globe. And also, again, this open forum is something that I hope a few people will volunteer um, to uh, accept as, as your task for this. And of course, one of, some of the most important things we can do is to bring the compelling stories to the level at which it might have its most strongest influence in the K through 12, especially K through six level. Um, I don't know if Michael uh, Douglas is here, but he and others, uh, have been working on this particular uh, part of our initiatives. And, and there's a lot that we can do, but also a lot of challenges that, that go with contributing to teaching at that level. Um, it fleshes out just a, a bit more in terms of text and expanded works. Instead of just giving a list of everything published in biogeography, again, we've got to give it uh, some structure. So somebody teaching, let's say for the first time, will have a sample or a list of books that they might consider as assigned text, including general texts, uh, advanced works, specialized texts in particular, well, particular taxa. And I'll show you a, a sample of what we've compiled so far. Texts in specializing in particular ecosystems and regions and time periods. And there really is a tremendous amount of information out there uh, available in particular texts. And we ha might have many other categories of uh, subdisciplines of the field, um, ecological versus historical biogeography, et cetera. And then also part of uh, resource material for uh, undergraduates, et cetera, would, would be uh, books, texts, et cetera, for a general audience, which I think are extremely important, uh, maybe more appropriate at the undergraduate level or for students undergraduate students, if not in science, uh, for those in other uh, disciplines that still want to understand or develop a better understanding, the standing of nature and why and how it varies from place to place. Uh, one thing we've, we've actually begun to compile, I just don't have this uh, available at least in these slides now, but 
extremely useful uh, to have syllabi that others have used for their courses. And I know when I started teaching this course, okay, 30 years ago, I feel kind of old. Uh, when I did, it would have been wonderful to, to, to look at a set of syllabi and see what people teach and how they walk in one subject and build on that for others. Uh, in addition to the text, then there, there are a number of videos available and we also might uh, develop a, a series of invited videos, invite distinguished lecturers in the field, but to give talks that, that fit incrementally within the uh, list of topics that we think uh, might be covered in particular courses in biogeography. Um, we have uh, lectures, a number of us, especially during this past year, have recorded their lectures. I know all of my lectures now for my biogeography course uh, are available as PowerPoint shows with videos, and I could make those available, um, and others can as well. Um, there are some extremely useful videos that, that I, I use in almost all the courses that I teach, for example, Paleomap, the ability to show others the, the dynamics of the earth and how the continents drifted across the globe and oceans were uh, created in some places and destroyed in others. We could easily just, just click on this link and open that up and share it with others, uh, deep time maps, et cetera. And there are also uh, other tools that uh, many of us have used, probably more so many of you than, than I, uh, that are extremely useful in terms of mapping things, uh, georeferencing data, uh, conducting spatial analyses uh, with uh, various types of stats or GIS. Um, there are a tremendous amount of resources on the distributions of species and Walter Jets and his colleagues have put together what I, what I think is what, one of the most comprehensive and intriguing sets of resources, the, the map of life. And just, just clicking on uh, this URL will get you there and um, get your appreciation for, for what they've done and what they continue to do. It's a tremendous resource that actually is still underutilized, but, but certainly fits within undergraduate and graduate education. And in that particular thing, map of life, I think carry, can carry itself across even down to the you know, pre-K and K through six levels as well. So Paleo View, the particular tool to um, identify and characterize particular places in the past in terms of their climatic conditions. Um, Damien Fordman and others have put that together. And there are many other tools uh, that I hope, again, those in the audience, colleagues, et cetera, and others who will join us eventually will contribute. Again, just just try and appreciate the, the battery of resources uh, that are out there and we hope we'll put together in one central place. The open forum, again, hopefully a number of you will come up with ideas on how best to set this up and carry it through and how often it should be. Um, and just, just realize that uh, anytime you come up with a good suggestion, that's equivalent to volunteering. So I'm gonna be taking names now. Just give you appreciation for uh, some of the things we, we've already done. Um, we have now already uh, compiled some lists uh, that fill in, flesh out part of that uh, template. Uh, here we're looking at general text in the field starting with 2000, um, or the most recent one going down to 2000. These happen to be in chronological order. We're not gonna include pricing for a number of reasons. Uh, here's another one of those subcategories, uh, advanced text. You get appreciation for how much is out there. Specialized works on particular taxa, on particular regions. And wouldn't it be wonderful, again, and we soon will make this available via the obvious website and our, our sub pages on that website. Wouldn't it be great to have this available to you and your students when you're developing or carrying through a course? Specialized works. I just have to do more work here in particular time periods. Works for general audiences. And again, there's a long list of others that would fit here in terms of, you know, those works that give the reader a better appreciation for how and why nature varies from place to place. Uh, I mentioned this before, I envision uh, 
filling particular gaps in the general education in this subject by inviting distinguished uh, biogeographers to contribute an invited lecture on a range of subjects, introductions and history of the science and its geological foundations, uh, environmental foundations, island biogeography, diversity, marine systems, conservation, biogeography. We could think of a number of distinguished colleagues in each of these sub-disciplines uh, that we could enlist to record one of the lectures. And we know there are other lectures available, including those uh, being organized by and presented by the society itself. Uh, and one of the most distinguished lecture series, except for the first speaker, uh, is the Vicki Funk Obvious Lecture Series. Uh, Vicki was one of our founding members and it's, it's a fitting tribute uh, that we have this, this lasting uh, recognition of her contributions to the field. And that link will get you to, I think Karen will correct me, there's at least five or six, maybe more uh, lectures actually available or linked to our site. And this is something, uh, one of the most important things we can do. A number of us have contributed in, in some ways, maybe limited ways to K through 12 education. Um, but this is obviously one of the most important things we can do. And, and I'm about to, to break now uh, into opening the discussion. This is certainly one, one of the most important things we can talk about. There are a number of questions, um, hurdles, challenges, pitfalls, but also tremendous potential for getting to young people at a stage before they have committed to other fields, before they think bio, Biology is just a random collection of cute little critters out there. Um, and so hopefully we'll continue to develop uh, a set of resources under this uh, category of life across the planet. Um, global resources, again, for enlightened K through 12 education. Uh, we've crafted, again, we, this is only in draft stage, but a description, essentially a preamble to prospective educators to K through 12 teachers uh, of why this might be of value to them. Not just how or what the resources are, but why teach uh, on the geography of life. And uh, over time, we'll develop a set of resources that they can pick and choose from that might better fit uh, their particular curriculum. Videos we talked about before, but some directed perhaps recorded, designed and recorded just for these levels of education uh, have tremendous potential in terms of actually intriguing and motivating the, these young people and giving essentially the world, the next generation, a better understanding for why nature is the way it is and how they can help conserve it. Uh, I think uh, there are many IMAX movies out there. I certainly think one on the uh, geography of life uh, would be an excellent contribution to the field. So I, I mentioned we have a, a preamble. This is just part of it. And I, I really don't want to you know, walk you through this too much, but uh, we're trying to sell this uh, in, in the back, you know, we write something like this, trying to use the voice of a, a David Attenborough, um, the compelling value of biogeography, the field of science that makes sense of the kaleidoscope of diversity of life across this planet by answering some very simple but intriguing and highly instructive questions. And again, <laughs> This is a draft, but what are those questions? I mean, these are questions that students ask, or at least they should ask, uh, where do particular species occur? Penguins, parrots, and polar bears. Where do they occur and why there and not elsewhere? Um, this this uh, idea of uh, penguins and polar bears, I mean, I experienced that myself. I, I still have uh, bed sheets for, for my daughter that has both polar bears and penguins on it. And as you know, we, they don't occur together, but most of the lay public thinks they can. And that's a really good starting point for describing the distinctiveness of place and then attempting to explain why places are inhabited by different animals, different plants and other organisms. Uh, other questions, why is biological diversity highest in the tropical forests and coral reefs and why not elsewhere? 
Why are species in one continent, Australia? Many people have heard of Australia. Why are they so different from those of other continents? Where did particular species, including our own species, where did we come from? Where did we first appear on the earth? And how did they or we spread to other places and in those places change over time? And most people are interested in extinction and endangered species. Well, where do the world's endangered species occur? And how can we protect those precious sanctuaries of nature? And these are just a sample of potential questions that might motivate teachers and their students to develop an understanding, help their students develop a fundamental understanding of the earth and its species. So other parts of this education would be packages, us developing packages of manipulatives and videos and other resources that the teachers again can choose, uh, pick and choose from and incorporate into their existing curriculum. We can actually on our own, I mean, we can develop specialized videos, short video vignettes on the geography of life. Um, Michael and others are brainstorming on coloring books and other things that can be used at these stages. There are, again, many challenges to this. Um, and we obviously, one of the resources I talked about before that I think works at just about any level is the map of life. And we will certainly have uh, particular resources or sets of links to those resources. Okay, uh, I believe Karen mentioned in the beginning, if, if not, I'll do it again here, is that uh, this is a, it will always be really a work in progress. We are about to launch our web pages in hopefully the next few weeks. Uh, and also we've uh, planned and we'll be hosting a workshop at our next society meetings in Vancouver in January of 2022. Um, so the announcement is out. Please, if you can join us either in person or virtually, uh, please join us at that workshop. And also, obviously this is uh, an invitation from the members in our existing committee to join us because we certainly can use your assistance, your insights, your suggestions, and any other contributions you may have to. Again, one I, what I think is one of the most important initiatives uh, that we might continue and carry on uh, for the society and for really enlightened education across the globe. So um, we're gonna open this up now to discussion on a number of different subjects. I'll just be taking notes and also names as well. Uh, if anytime you wanna contact me, my email is island at esf.edu. Um, so if we can open this up, um, Karen, should I stop? Well, let me just uh, give you a list of potential questions and then I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen so I can actually see your faces as well. Uh, and again, one of the things that uh, we need to continue to, to work on uh, and develop and has a number of provocative aspects to it is uh, the K through 12 education on the geography of life, uh, what we're calling right now life across planet Earth. What are, what are the needs? Why do we need such a thing? Uh, what are the best approaches to suggest? What are the challenges? And it really are many challenges as well as many opportunities. Um, I certainly need assistance or somebody to take the reins and uh, help develop this open forum. I think it can be of an extremely useful, if not an essential component of our initiative. Uh, we need lists of uh, and descriptions of other books and uh you know all i've done so far is put together those lists without really even a sentence or two of a description but we can use assistance in that aspect as well um we're not posting the price of those books but there are con some concerns and valid ones about how expensive books are these days i will point out we can discuss this but even for buying geography text there are less expensive alternatives. I mean, I recommend to my students you know, get the digital copy of the book. There are audio books available too. Um, I've got a very different small book that I recommend for my undergraduate course. It's uh, one of the 
to the Oxford series, very short introductions that, that is very inexpensive and the audiobook is free. Um, what are the categories of texts, you know, should we include in that, in that template? What are the sources of videos are out there? Um, this invited series uh, of contributions, uh, videos by distinguished lecturers, how can we best develop that? Uh, what are the categories, modalities, am I just totally missing in this uh, template, in this initial plan? How best to reach corporations and governments and NGOs and have them actually partner with us for education at all levels, and especially, especially at the K through 12 level. Um, what are some of the additional subjects that we should be addressing when we teach biogeography? And uh, George and others have mentioned and emphasized uh, integrating uh, education on traditional knowledge and what indigenous people knew and how colonization uh, influenced development of ideas and actually may have limited those development of ideas and how uh, many of our curricula perhaps unwittingly still uh, has these, these legacies or holdovers of the colonizing of different parts of the world. Um, what do we need funding for? What, where should we look for funding? Uh, what are some of the concerns when we actually go out and ask for funding, remembering that our society is uh, still a not-for-profit society. So any initiative we have has to be clear of profit as well. Um, what are other points, uh, you know, should, should I be, we be including in discussion and how can you contribute? We're gonna be open for that. I'll do my best to take notes. Fortunately, we're recording. Any others on the committee, please also uh, assist me with taking notes. And again, uh, if you need to contact me, please do so uh, just by sending me an email. Little busy week coming up. I'm teaching three courses. I've got uh, essay exams for hundred students, but hopefully things will clear up in about 10 days. Thanks again, Karen, for uh, helping us host this. And I'm gonna stop, going to stop sharing and see if we can actually have an open discussion on any of these topics or others you think might be important, um, perhaps uh, using the gallery mode here.